Hello everybody, I hope you're all well. So today I am back with another reality TV show analysis video because my last video, which was about I Wanna Marry Harry, went down so well with you guys, which I was really surprised about. So thank you guys so much. But today's video is going to be a lot darker than that video. I have put a list of trigger warnings at the beginning of this video because I'm going to be talking about very sensitive topics throughout this video. So if you didn't get a chance to look at that, make sure you go back and look at that before proceeding watching this video. And today is actually going to be a two part video as well. The next part should be up in a few days. It's not gonna be long at all, don't worry. And today we are going to be talking about the reality show, The Biggest Loser, which was originally an American reality show, which aired in 2004, where 12 obese contestants compete against each other to lose the most weight. There's usually multiple challenges and an elimination process, which I'm gonna elaborate more on later in this video and it happens over the course of around seven months and they don't just stay at home and lose weight on their own they move to the biggest loser ranch where they have no contact with the outside world they are split into two teams where their captains are personal trainers and the winner of the biggest loser is the contestant who loses the largest percentage of their body weight and the winner actually wins a cash prize of 250 thousand dollars and i'm gonna come out and say this now i have not watched an entire season of this show because first of all it's actually really difficult to find entire seasons to watch anyway and on top of that this show is not enjoyable to watch at all it honestly it's it's painful i can't lie it's just so uncomfortable to watch and i watched a few episodes and some clips on youtube honestly i wasn't going to put myself through watching watching an entire season and honestly I don't even recommend you guys to watch this as a hate watch or anything like that because there's nothing enjoyable about it it's just extremely uncomfortable and painful to watch I'm gonna be honest and I do just want to quickly disclaim that there are contestants who have had positive experiences on the show and are open about how they're really glad that they went on the show and that the show positively impacted their life and they changed their life for the better but that does not take away from the fact that there are more and more contestants coming forward talking about their negative experiences on the show talking about how the show negatively impacted their life and it also just doesn't take away from the blatant fat phobia and toxicity of the show hey you 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 at home i am talking to you america we're the fattest country in the world. And shockingly, a lot of very shady things, allegedly, trying to protect myself, happened behind the scenes. A lot of contestants are coming forward, talking about their experiences, which I will be discussing in today's video. And before I get into it, I would just like to thank today's sponsor, Intamina. Intamina have sponsored one of my videos before, and I really like working with them because not only do I like their products, but I also really like the brand brand itself. They have a very non-judgmental and open approach to periods because talking about your period should not be stigmatized. It's a period for heaven's sake. It's natural. It happens to so many of us. There's nothing shameful or disgusting about having a period or about talking about your period. And this time Intamina sent me one of their bundles. They sent me their Urban Warrior bundle. And already I love that Intamina offer bundles because it's a great way to save money. On the bundle which I received, I believe that you save a around 15 pounds, but I had a look on the website myself and some of the bundles you can save up to 45 pounds. So I really recommend that you guys go and check it out. But the Urban Warrior bundle comes with the Lily Cup Compact, which I've spoken about on my channel before and you guys know that I really like it. It comes with the original Lily Cup, the Feminine Moisturizer and also a cleaner for your <laughs> Lily Cups. Can you tell that I'm struggling doing this with one hand? Now, Lily Cups do come in different sizes. Size A, which is the one that I have here, is recommended for people who haven't given birth or have had c-sections or have sort of a medium flow and the size b is recommended to people who have given birth have a weaker pelvic floor or have a heavier flow but regardless both lily cups are still ideal for people with higher cervixes and a heavier flow they do hold more than an average tampon so you don't need to worry about leaking they're also easy to use because you can roll them as thin as a tampon when you insert it and sort of its angled shape really complements your anatomy very well so they're very comfortable 
reusable and of course they are reusable and eco-friendly. If you guys are interested in checking out Intamina and their products, make sure you guys click the link in the description and thank you so much Intamina for sponsoring today's video. Part one, fat phobia. Before we discuss the biggest loser, we have to talk about fat phobia because without fat phobia, I really doubt that a show like The Biggest Loser would even exist, let alone thrive the way it did. Now, I'm not going to go into extreme depth with this topic because I just don't feel like I'm the right person to talk about it. I don't have any firsthand experience with it and I don't want to talk over anyone. But when you do bring up a topic like fat phobia to people who are being fat phobic, it's very, very common that people will sort of use the health defense for the reason that they're being fat phobic. They say something very much along the lines of if you're obese or overweight, you're going to get a range of different diseases and you will die. Therefore, me being fat phobic towards you is almost seen as a necessary evil. You know, they're not trying to be mean. They're trying to save people's lives. <laughs> so noble, I know. I think that the way that we are taught about health and weight growing up, ironically, is very unhealthy. Growing up, we are taught that your weight equates to your health. So if you aren't at a healthy weight, if you are overweight or obese, you are automatically deemed as unhealthy. And before we debunk that, we need to discuss how weight is measured, how doctors figure out whether you're underweight, normal weight, overweight or obese, etc. A majority of doctors will take something called a BMI, which is a body mass index, where they take your height and your weight, they square it, and then they do a mass thing to it, and then they work it out. As you guys can tell, I'm not I'm not good at maths. I, I don't know. And if your BMI is 25 or over, you are considered overweight. But BMI is honestly a terrible and inaccurate way of measuring weight. To quote a Medical News Today article, it does not take into account muscle mass, bone density, overall body composition, and racial and sex differences. Also guys, BMI wasn't even created by a doctor. It was created by a mathematician in the 19th century. We're still using this 200 years later and it wasn't even created by a doctor. There are so many people who share their experiences with having to be weighed at school. Over here in the UK, the first time you get weighed in school, I was around 11 or maybe 10. And if your BMI comes back that you're overweight, they will recommend your parents to put you on a diet as a child, age 10. And I know that there are plenty of people who who got told by a school doctor that they were overweight and that they needed to be put on a diet and that it contributed to their future eating disorders. But circling back to my earlier point, we are taught growing up that weight always equates to health, which isn't always the case, especially if we're using BMI. There are plenty of people who BMI wise are considered overweight or obese and are living healthy lifestyles. They eat healthily, they eat a well-rounded diet, they go to the gym, they're active people. Yet people always jump to the conclusion that if you're fat, that you're unhealthy and that you have to be shamed into leading a healthier lifestyle. As if body shaming has ever helped anyone. I mean, body shaming has already been proved to not work. On the other end of things, just because someone is deemed to have a healthy weight does not mean that they are living a healthy lifestyle. And there is a walking, talking example right in front of you guys. Me. I'm a slim person and I haven't had my BMI I taken in years, but I'm going to assume that it's a healthy BMI. I don't have a very well-rounded diet. I basically live off chili beef nachos most of the time. I have actually quit smoking. I don't smoke anymore. I mean, I do social smoke, but we're not going to talk about that. I don't exercise unless I walk to places because I don't drive. I don't go to the gym and I get drunk every weekend. So I'm assuming that that isn't helping me either. But people would look at me and would assume that I'm living a healthy lifestyle which I'm not. And there are plenty of people who are considered overweight or obese who are living much healthier lifestyles than I am. And fat phobia has been rampant in society for years, but it can actually be dated back all the way to the transatlantic slave trade. I've spoken about this on my channel before, but fat phobia does have a lot of racist origins. I really recommend getting the book Fearing the Black Body, The Racial Origins of Fat Phobia by Sabrina Strings. If you guys want to find out more about this, because I'm only going to 
gonna be discussing it very, very simply. Before the transatlantic slave trade, being fat was actually seen as desirable. It was basically the beauty standard at the time. I think it was because it showed that you were wealthy. But once the transatlantic slave trade began, a lot of very racist French philosophers started theorizing about black people and their bodies and theorized that black people were overindulgent, that they ate too much food and had too much sex. So after that, the beauty standard basically flipped and being skinny was seen as being desirable. And it flipped because Europeans wanted to prove that they had self-control and that they were the superior race. Obviously, it's all rooted in white supremacy and racism. And it hasn't really changed since then. Of course, there have sort of been differences between what sort of body type is in trend. It usually sort of goes from the straight up and down, sort of on the skinnier side of skinny to maybe the sort of more thicker hourglass body. But either way, they're still slim bodies. And the racial origins of fat phobia do still carry over today. One example of this is police brutality. A lot of the time when a police officer murders a black man, they will blame their size for the reason that they used lethal force. There is a really great article about this on Teen Vogue, which I will link down below so you guys can read it. A lot of this information is from that article. One example is Michael Brown. He was an unarmed teenager and he was six foot four and 210 pounds. And he was murdered by police officer Darren Wilson. And when Darren Wilson was in court, he said, grabbing him felt like a five-year-old holding onto Hulk Hogan. That's just how big he felt and how small I felt just from groping his arm. Bear in mind, Darren Wilson was also six foot four and was 210 pounds. Comparing the teenager that he murdered to Hulk Hogan to try and justify murdering him. And I think the most prevalent example of this was the murder of Eric Garner. He was murdered by police officer Daniel Pantaleo. And when the courts decided not to indict him, they released a statement to CNN saying, you had a 350 pound person who was resisting arrest. The police were trying to bring him down as quickly as possible. If he had not had asthma and a heart condition and was so obese, almost definitely he would not have died. The courts blamed his obesity on the reason that he died and not the police officer who put him in a chokehold until he lost consciousness. These are just two examples, but there is a pattern of police officers blaming black men's size and stature and weight for the reason that they murder them and the reason that they feel threatened to try and justify murdering them. Fat phobia affects people's job opportunities, their living situations, the way they're treated, and it especially affects them in the medical field. If someone who is overweight or obese goes to a doctor or a hospital with a medical issue, not only will they likely not be taken very seriously, but the first piece of advice before any sort of medication is to lose weight. And even if their medical condition has no correlation to being overweight or obese, and some doctors will even recommend losing weight before they even prescribe them with any medication. Obviously, this was a very brief explanation of fat phobia and its racist origins. I really recommend checking out the book Fearing the Black Body if you guys want to know more. I also recommend checking out Deshaun Harrison's website. They talk a lot about their experiences with racism and fat phobia and how it often intersects with one another. I also recommend checking out the podcast Maintenance Phase, who very often debunks myths surrounding being fat and fat phobia. And they did actually make an entire episode about The Biggest Loser, which really helped me out with my research. So I recommend checking that out as well. Part two a typical episode of The Biggest Loser. Now let's talk about The Biggest Loser. As I said earlier in this video, there's usually around 12 to 14 contestants and they are split into two teams and their captains are personal trainers. Each episode is two hours long, including ad breaks. And each episode features some or all of these challenges. There is a temptation challenge, which is probably one of the most messed up ones where contestants have the option to eat a temptation food in exchange for a prize. If you guys don't know what a temptation food is, it's basically an unhealthy food. So pizza, mac and cheese, donuts, you know, stuff like that. And some of the prizes which they are offered are exercise equipment, extra time in the gym, and phone calls home. 
In every episode, there is a reward challenge where the teams have to compete against each other doing an exercise challenge in order to win a prize. And usually it isn't a normal exercising challenge like jogging or rowing or something like that. It's usually something absolutely ridiculous, which I really doubt has any health benefits, such as attaching themselves to food trucks with harnesses and pulling it over a finishing line or running a mile on a beach with driftwood strapped to their back. And the prize for the winning team slash winning individual can range from anything from exercise equipment, cooking classes, which often have very heavy heavy product placement, but we'll talk about that later. Extra time in the gym, phone calls home, immunity, but the most common prize we see are pound advantages. And basically these pound advantages are used in the weigh-in. So if you have a three pound weight advantage, three pounds is taken off your total weight lost. I will explain the weigh-ins in just a moment. There is the initial workout, which basically involves all the contestants being verbally abused by their trainers and then exercising to the point of throwing up, passing out, and sometimes even being hospitalized. Let me explain something to you. When your lips turn blue, then you're gonna pass out, okay? But you're not gonna die. And sometimes during these initial workouts, a contestant will get very emotionally distressed and will reveal the events which usually are very traumatic, which led to their weight gain. There is also the last chance workout, which is the workout just before the weigh-in, which often involves even more verbal abuse, throwing up and passing out, and of course, sometimes even being hospitalized. Maybe something wrong. He came to me and said, I feel like I'm gonna go down. Squeeze my hand, squeeze my hand. And then there is the weigh-in. Now, I think it's quite obvious that the weigh-in actually isn't done live. Like those giant scales that they stand on aren't actually real scales. They get weighed before and then their weights get put in an order which sort of drum up the most drama and tension because at the end of the day, the biggest loser is a reality show. But the contestants still don't know how much weight they've lost until the weigh-in. And the team which loses the largest percentage of their body weight wins and the two contestants from the losing team that lost the least amount of their body weight percentage sorry that took me a while to get out are up for elimination and the teams have to deliberate who they're going to send home and basically vote who they're going to send home and it's something which is very important to mention another fucked up thing about the biggest loser is that when the contestants were voting and deliberating who to send home they would have to go into a room which had all different mini fridges with their names on it and it was filled with all of their personal temptation food so all of their favorite temptation food and they basically had the option to eat it or not and on top of that the way they would reveal what contestant they chose to send home was that they would put their name on a little piece of cardboard on a silver platter and cover it with a dish. It's actually sick. Part three, the contestants. I think almost an integral cog to the biggest loser machine is the contestants which they choose to go on the show. In its peak, the biggest loser was so popular that thousands of people were applying to go on it every single year. And this was discussed on the maintenance phase podcast, but the biggest loser obviously chooses overweight and obese people who aren't healthy and aren't happy with their bodies and imply that every single overweight or obese person is like this, which just isn't the case. As I said earlier, there are plenty of people who are considered overweight or obese who are living healthy lifestyles and slash or are very happy with their bodies. And I do just want to add that there is nothing wrong with wanting to lead a healthier lifestyle and make a change in your life. The contestants aren't the people to blame here, but just because someone is fat and unhealthy doesn't make them any lesser of a person. It doesn't make them a bad person, which is what the biggest loser seems to imply in every single one of their episodes that you're only worthy of respect if you're thin not if you're healthy if you're thin but I will elaborate more on this later but honestly I don't think that that's the worst part about the contestant selection on the biggest loser the worst part is that they very clearly choose contestants who have eating disorders or have very unhealthy relationships with food have binge eating disorders believe 
leukemia, a lot of contestants who have experienced very real trauma in their lives and use food as a comfort. And I'm going to talk more about what the contestants endured on the show, but it probably definitely made their relationships with food a lot worse. And I think one of the worst parts about the show is that a lot of these contestants have very real emotional trauma and mental issues, yet there aren't any therapists on set and their personal trainers almost double up as their therapists. Even though their personal trainers are not licensed therapists, they're only personal trainers. And as far as I'm aware, there's absolutely no therapists on set on the show. There was one contestant on season 16, Erin, who was actually a contestant on The Voice and she went for her first weigh-in and I think she lost around 10 pounds and she got very emotional while she was on the scales and the host asked, when was the last time that you lost this much weight? And she said it was when she was bulimic and it was still celebrated. No one saw anything wrong with it and it was honestly just really sad to watch. And also another thing to note about the contestants is it's pretty known that some of the contestants actually enter for the prize money and not actually to lose weight. There are some contestants who allegedly have admitted to entering the competitions they could pay off their college debt. And one moment which really stuck in my head, which was from season 16, is right at the beginning, they get all of the contestants to run, I think it was a mile on a treadmill. And whilst they were running, the host offered five $5,000 to anyone that would quit the show on the spot and no one took it and then he upped it to $10,000 and eventually he upped it all the way to $25,000 and went up to one of the contestants who he probably knew was poor and asked them how much $25,000 meant to them and this guy said that means everything to me I could pay off all my debt with that money and still chose not to take it waving $25,000 thousand dollars in someone who probably is living below the poverty line in their face whilst they're running on a treadmill is just so unbelievably cruel and this is all done to prove that you're really in it that you're really motivated because twenty five thousand dollars can't tempt you and one thing which is frustrating to watch about this show is that very rarely is any thought or consideration given to the contestants who are living in poverty the only only way that they address this is by giving all of the contestants a free membership to Planet Fitness for a year, which is so obviously product placement. What about contestants who don't live anywhere near a Planet Fitness? What about contestants who live in food deserts? What about contestants who have an extremely busy work schedule and don't have time to meal prep? What about contestants who balance work and childcare? If you have a hectic home and work life, it's going to be much easier to just throw a red meal in the microwave than it is to cook something fresh. What about contestants who can't afford fresh healthy food and it's just a lot more financially sustainable for them to buy frozen food? The Biggest Loser doesn't answer any of these questions relating to sort of the socio-economic and environmental factors of why people can't live healthy lifestyles even if they want to. Instead they just push all this very obvious product placement which I will discuss more in the second part of this video. Part four or shady behavior. Now onto the biggest bulk of this video, the shady behavior. And honestly, I think calling the way the biggest loser treated their contestants as shady behavior is honestly the biggest understatement of the year, but I had no idea what else to call this section. And the way the biggest loser treated their contestants is just another example of how reality TV shows exploit very real people for viewership and how there is no care for these contestants. And all this information is alleged. I'm not trying to get sued by The Biggest Loser. Firstly, let's talk about the way The Biggest Loser manipulated their audience. The first thing is with the weigh-ins. They're a very integral part of the show. They're done every week and whichever contestant loses the least amount of weight is usually sent home. And as I said earlier, the scales aren't real. It's all put in an order to sort of drum up the drama and tension. And for some of you guys who haven't watched the show, the amount of weight weight that these contestants lose is crazy. When I was watching it, the first contestant that got put on the scale in their first week lost 10 
pounds and I was shocked. I, my jaw hit the floor. I was absolutely baffled. I was like, Jesus Christ, like 10 pounds is nearly a stone in one week. And then another person in that episode lost 25 pounds in a week. And from what I watched, it seems to be very normal that the first week is the week that you lose the most amount of weight and that the second week you usually lose significantly less. And what was so hard to watch is that a lot of these contestants went from losing like 15, 16, 20 pounds to then losing six pounds, seven pounds, four pounds, which is still a lot of weight to lose in a week. And you could see these contestants getting emotional, crying, really beating themselves up over it because this show has made them put all of their self-worth into how much weight they're losing. They will beat themselves up for not maintaining losing 15 pounds a week, which is already impossible. But anyways, according to season three contestant Kai Hibbard, they don't actually do the weigh-ins every single week. They don't do weigh in seven days apart. A lot of the time it's usually two to three weeks, but the show will tell the audience that these contestants lost 20 pounds in one week, which as we all know, is probably pretty unlikely. And this is messed up because a big thing about The Biggest Loser is that it basically built an empire for itself and ended up sort of expanding into fitness DVDs, cookbooks, exercise plans, stuff like that. But I'm gonna talk more about that in the second part of the video. And they're leading their their audience to believe that losing 15 pounds a week is normal and that it's achievable and really manipulating their audience. And usually this manipulated the audience to buy their products, but we'll talk more about that later. And also another thing which The Biggest Loser did, which I forgot to mention in this video, is that they actually make all of their contestants do the weigh-ins in either a sports bra or the men have to do it topless. They have no other choice. They have to do that until they reach below a certain weight, then they're allowed to put their tops back on. And according to past contestants, The Biggest Loser had them eating under 1000 calories a day. Kai Hibbard said that she was eating basically only sugar-free jello and asparagus. And asparagus is a diuretic. I think that's how you pronounce it. And if you guys don't know what a diuretic is, it's basically a food which makes you pee more. So the more she pees, the less water weight she'll hold. One of the trainers, Jillian Michaels, allegedly gave her team caffeine pills so they'd have more energy to exercise. And speaking of exercise, the Biggest Loser got their contestants to exercise six to eight hours a day, which is 10 times the recommended amount. But back onto the topic of the contestants' diet, an NBC investigation which actually launched into the show after a handful of past contestants alleged that they were given diet pills whilst on the show. And as you guys can probably tell, these contestants were being completely malnourished. Therefore, their bodies started negatively reacting and basically shutting down because they were being starved. Some of the contestants have alleged that they experienced hair loss. One of the winners, Ryan Benson, who lost 122 pounds, which was 37% of his body weight, said that towards the end of the competition, he started urinating blood, which is a sign of not only dehydration, but also kidney damage. And I think what's the most sort of hypocritical, ironic, like frustrating thing about watching this show is the biggest loser over and over again in every single episode, every chance they get, will paint itself as a show which cares about the nation's health, which is so off the mark, it's honestly laughable. Not only do they allegedly restrict their contestants to under 1,000 calories a day, but also there's very little food-based education in the show unless it's heavy, heavy product placement. So as a viewer, or at least as a critical viewer, you honestly don't know what to believe. Also on top of that, this show is so obviously riddled with misinformation. I have no idea how they get away with it. One example was when I was watching it, I think it was an episode from season 16, they were doing like this calorie counting challenge and the host, I think his name's Ben or Ryan, it's Ben, was trying to convince me that this tiny little bowl of mac and cheese was too thousand calories. I mean, I don't know how different things are in America, but I know that a tiny little bowl of mac and cheese is not 2000 calories. Are you having me on? They're trying to dupe me 
and I'm not buying it. And not only does this show obsess over calories, which honestly I think is very counterproductive, but also they act like eating a piece of bread is going to kill their contestants. Like they actually completely demonize carbs. But to be fair, I think the demonization of carbs is just a reflection on 2000s diet culture. But back onto the topic of exercise, not only did the biggest loser allegedly get their contestants to exercise six to eight hours a day, which is 10 times the recommended amount, got their contestants to take part in dehydration tactics. If you don't know what dehydration tactics are, it's basically when you exercise in a room, but you shut all the windows and doors and you start layering up your clothing so you sweat more. And they also got their contestants to sweat it out in saunas as well. And they got their contestants, allegedly, to take part in dehydration tactics so much that some of them had to take salt replacement tablets because they were losing so much salt from sweating so much. During exercise segments of the show, it was very common to see contestants throwing up, passing out, and even being hospitalized. And as most of us know, if you are exercising towards the point of throwing up and passing out, it's your body giving you a message, telling you that you need to stop. But if you are a contestant who doesn't push past the throwing up or passing out, you are seen as weak and lazy. And this isn't even the worst part about the exercising segments. For me personally, the worst part about the exercising segments is the verbal abuse abuse that these contestants get from their trainers. This is something which is actually very widely talked about because it's just aged so badly. One of the trainers, Jillian Michaels, is very infamous for just being absolutely vile towards the contestants. And if you guys don't know her, I'm going to read out a few of her famous quotes just to sort of set the tone, set the mood. I don't care if people die on this floor, you better die looking good. I'm proud, I'm proud that, that I made, I made him, vomit. him vomit. If you don't run, I will pull Alex on the floor and I will break every bone in his body. I don't, I care, don't care if one of your one legs, of your legs falls, off, falls off or if one or of if your one lungs, of lungs explode. explode. The only way you're coming off this damn treadmill is if you die on it. It's fun watching other people suffer like that. And there are a lot of other shady things which The Biggest Loser have done, which I will be discussing in the next part of this video, which will be up in a few days. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. Give it a thumbs up if you liked it. And thank you so much Intermina for sponsoring today's video. And I will see you literally only in a couple of days for the next part of this video. Bye.